Jesus. Could we all stand to our feet right now? Praise the Lord. We're going to change the order of service and we're going to ask for Brother Holloway to come and obey the Lord again tonight. Amen. Let's, let's give him a hand clap and give the Lord a hand clap and pray when he comes to us. Scripture is the word soul, is the Greek word psyche. And so I'll read it as it was heard when those Greek speaking um, people at Colossae heard this. They would have heard, I would that you all would be mature in the spiritual things, in your minds, and in your bodies. And it's also interesting that you look at the, the priority of statement. Paul, that he doesn't say, I would that you would be mature in body first or in mind first. There is an importance in looking at what Paul said first. He said, I would that you would be mature in spirit, in mind, and in body. And I have found something to be true in my walk with God is that when the adversary wants to speak to my mind, he's going to hit my body. He is going to affect things in the natural that are going on around me, things that my body can experience, my eyes. He's not necessarily going to make you sick all the time, but if he wants to get into my head, he's going to have to appeal to my eyes. He'll have to appeal to my hearing. He'll have to appeal to my senses in the physical. That's why body was mentioned last. The adversary gets access to the mind through the lowest part of the human experience. That's body. But when the Lord wants to speak to the mind, he does it through spirit, the highest parts of the human experience. And so it's of utmost value to be mature in all three areas so that even in the body, the adversary has no access. And this is why I personally want to offer my eyes unto God. I don't just look at anything I want to look at anymore. I don't listen to whatever I want to look, listen to. I'll teach you something very valuable. When you hear somebody who are venting or gossiping, whatever you want to call it, or Facebooking, whatever it is, when teaching you a valuable lesson, just lift up your hand and say, whoa, I need to hear any of that. All right. You're becoming mature in even the lowest parts of the human experience. Right. But what I want to focus on is that the mind is stuck right between the body and spirit. And that's where I want to read our text. Joshua chapter 17. I'm going to start with verse 15. Shortly after this, I'm going to go to 2 Corinthians 10. If you don't have to turn there, many of you will know it. If you don't, that's okay. You'll know it tonight. Joshua's chapter 17, verse 15. And Joshua said to them, If you are a numerous people, go up by yourselves to the forest, 
And there clear ground for yourselves in the land of the Perizzites and the Rephaim, since the hill country of Ephraim is too narrow for you. So the people of Joseph said, the hill country is not enough for us. Yet all the Canaanites who dwell in the plain, they have chariots of iron, both those in Bashim and its villages and those in the valley of Jezreel. Then Joshua said to the house of Joseph, to Ephraim, Manasseh, you are a numerous people and you have great power. You shall not have one allotment only, but the hill country shall be yours. For though it is a forest, you shall clear it and possess it to its farthest borders. For you shall drive out the Canaanites, though they have chariots of iron and though they be strong. 2 Corinthians 10, 4 just says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God. Listen to what this says. To the pulling down of strongholds. What is a stronghold in the New Testament? It's not a little pagan image sitting on a hill anymore. This is where the pagans rest. It says casting down imaginations. Every high thing, that yes. was the word used for images on hills in the Old Testament. Uh -huh. He says every high thing that will exalt itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity Every thought yes. to the obedience of Christ. Mm. Paul thought it very important for us to become mature in our minds. Because if your mind is not mature, you cannot have a mature body experience. And you will never have a mature spirit if this right here is a wreck. Mm -hmm. And so I want to minister with that on your minds. I want to minister tonight, clear the forest. There's something that is nestled within Joshua 17 that God has revealed to me that is of utmost importance to the body tonight. And I feel that this is a needed word for many in this room. So if you would, would you do me this? Before you lift your hands, this is what I ask. You don't get much out of church services. This isn't church, by the way. This is a meeting for the church. But you don't get much out of this if your mind is everywhere else. You just, you just don't. I'll be honest with you, you can blame the preaching, you can blame whoever you want to, but this is on you at the end of every night. You do what you want to do. And you can't blame preaching, you can't blame anything. This, you get out of this what you set your mind on. And so here's what I want you to ask you. In your prayer time, when we're about to pray, I want you to offer up your minds unto God. And I want you to pray this, just this simple scripture. I want you to set your affections on things above, not on things of this earth. But to do that, we have to set our minds over there. So right now, would you just put a leash around your mind and pull it away from the job, pull it away from problems, pull it away from bills, pull it away from worries, and just point your mind heavenward right now. Think about the face of God. Think about the presence of God. Think about what you would like to feel from him tonight. Not what you want from him, but what you want to feel. You want to be in his presence. Think on these things. Father... I give you all honor. I'll give you all glory. I give you all praise. God, these are your people. And these are a great people. God, I pray that you would help me by the spirit tonight to appeal to the mind so that the mind can appeal to the spirit and so that the spirit can speak to the body. Father, I pray that your people would be brought up into a heavenly place. I pray that their minds, oh God, would be healed of the guilt. I pray that their minds would be healed of of the worry, that all the things that come against us, so oh Father, that you would begin the healing process tonight. Lord, I want to join with your spirit in speaking to the unseen things. There may not be a healing in the body. If there is, God, that's more than we can ask for, and I believe you will do it. But God, I'm appealing to the things that no one can see, the damaged muscle of the mind. God, you do your perfect work in this place. And I believe and I will speak under your anointing tonight that as your word goes forth, not mine, that I believe things will begin to move around in the minds of your people and that healing will take place behind the veil of their very eyes. In the name of Jesus, I give you glory for it. In your name we pray. Amen. Would you say amen this evening? Amen. You can be seated. To give you some context to the opening scripture in Joshua 17, as you're reading it, you'll find that in the beginning chapters of the book that Israel is now swapped leadership from Moses to now a young and very capable Joshua. And I don't believe that Joshua is just capable because of his youth, but you'll find that Joshua is capable because there's a little mention of him that says he never left the holy place. Joshua knew how to dwell in the presence of God, and this is what made him eligible for leadership. And now under the leadership of Joshua, they are finally advancing forward into the land of promise. Canaan. It's finally they're doing this after they left Egypt 40 years prior to this moment. But 
There's something that you must understand and we must grapple with this reality. And I don't think that it is said often enough within our sanctimonious entities of church that even though something is a promised land, it does not declare it a free land. I, I am very passionate about the prophets. I'm very passionate about the topic of prophetic things. And I think we have this tendency to think that just because a prophecy goes forward that it's going to happen. It will happen, but it don't necessarily have to happen with you because prophecies always need participants. Just because it's a prophecy doesn't give us an excuse to be lazy and it's just going to happen. You have to participate with the prophecy. It was prophesied that these Israelites would go into the promised land and they didn't. They died in the wilderness. Another generation went in. So God's prophecy came to pass, but not through the ones it was told to. Because prophecies need participants. And there's a generation that has gotten hold of this revelation. Now the Israelites realize, okay, this land is promised. But we're going to have to go take up some arms and fight for it. There were people, you see, in the land that had to be conquered because gaining the kingdom is not a free enterprise. Just because God prophesied that there will be an increase of souls does not excuse us to sit at home and never go reach a soul. Right. We still have to participate with the prophecy. And you can label somebody as a false prophet because something didn't come to pass. But if you've read your Bible, actually a false prophet is someone who received money for a prophecy. That's really what a false prophet is, right. by the way. There were people in this land that had to be conquered. And God needed a people that were willing to participate with that. Because it requires work and it is a fight. And before you think that that is ungodly and unbiblical, God placed Adam and Eve in the heavenly place of Eden in the garden to work it and keep it. So from Joshua chapter 1 to Joshua chapter 13, there was seven years straight of work and fighting. You see, you and I can read Joshua chapter 1 through chapter 13, and we can do that in, if you're a little bit of a quicker reader, you can read that in about 25 to 30 minutes. You can read that over your morning cup of coffee. But for them to conquer that much territory took them seven years. And I think that it's hard to keep that in mind as we're reading our Bible that these prophecies, these visions given to prophets, I, I've read the prophets numerous times and I look at them and I'm like, my God, they seem like they had visions all the time, Brother Hereford. But the prophetic books are over the span of 40 years. And when you look at the span of 40 years sometimes and they had seven to ten visions, that's not a whole lot of God speaks. That's a whole lot of God talking and us waiting for the next word and working until that last word came to pass. But I noticed something interesting in the life of the young leader, Joshua, because something burrowed its way. I can't pinpoint through Bible reading where it came from. Maybe it's personality. I don't know. But something burrowed its way into the psyche of Joshua that God, I'm so thankful to see, was willing to work with this young leader and began to strive breaking down something that had got into the mind of Joshua. And we get a glimpse of this because God has to say to Joshua nine times, be of good courage and do not fear the people that would war against this new land. Be of good cheer or be of good courage and do not fear the people nine times. And I'm thankful for the grace of God that contends with a human that is struggling with something in his mind. And God says, you're the man that's going into the promised land. But in order for you to have the victories that I know you can have, I'm going to have to speak to that thing that's burrowed its way into your mind. You're fearful, Joshua, but I'm not mad at you. I need to work with you. I need to participate with you as you participate with me. But before you can go and do that which I've called you to do, we're going to have to take care of that fear. Right. There's something that has burrowed its way because kingdom efforts and kingdom advancement is all ebbing and flowing off of what's right here. We think that it is oftentimes our effort, our striving, and oftentimes we're not getting everything that God has prophesied because we haven't become mature in these areas. In fact, you'll see that God says, I can't let you advance too far into the promised land because... There are things there that if you advance too quickly, you won't have enough resources to maintain it. Right. So there needs to be a maturing in your mind to know that you need to take care of resources before I give you too much. This is becoming complete in spirit, mind, and body. 
So by faith, Joshua advances forward and fought every city. And you can imagine he's hearing the words of God in his mind. And as he steps onto a battlefield, he's carrying more than a sword and a shield. I guarantee you he looked and he had moments of trepidation, moments of fear trying to come back. But he arrested those thoughts yes. that would exalt itself against the knowledge that God had already given him. Be of good courage and do not fear. I'm sure it would become his mantra. He would begin to quote it on every battlefield. And he would recite it to himself because the nerves would inevitably come back every battle. But in order to step foot on that battlefield, he had to quote the word of God that was given to him. Joshua 10, 40 tells us this. So Joshua struck the whole land, the hill country and the Negev and the lowland and the slopes and all their kings. He left none remaining but devoted to destruction all that breathed, just as the Lord God of Israel commanded. You see, this is powerful because Joshua allowed the words spoken to him to permeate his mind, not his doubts to permeate his mind, not his fears. Both were contending for him. And as he stepped onto the battlefield, no doubt the lowest part of him was looking at people far greater than him, armies far more numerous than theirs. And he said, I'm not going to appeal to the lowest side of me. I'm too mature for that because of his voice. The low things, my eyes, my ears hear the clanging of the swords as they provoke us and as they taunt us. But here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to arrest my My mind is going to arrest my eyes and I'm going to look upon God. My mind is going to arrest my ears and I'm going to listen to the last word he said. And this, I have found, takes tremendous discipline. Why? Because the kingdom is worth the struggle. These victories came about because Joshua was convinced by God to be strong, to have courage, to not fear. These battles would have never been won if Joshua would have allowed fear to take control in his mind. And Joshua 13 rolls around and we see something unique happen. It says, now Joshua was old. And I like how it starts. It's straight to the point. It's offensive. Joshua, you're old. And then it just eases in into your advancing years. <laughs> And the Lord said to him, you are old. And then God says that you are old and advanced in years. But this is what God tells Joshua. There remains yet very much land to possess. You have fought for seven years, Joshua. Thank you for hearing my word and using your effort to arrest your mind and to submit your mind to the words I gave you. I know that that wasn't easy, but thank you. Thank you for investing in the kingdom and being worth being worth or trying to to realize that this is worth your effort. Thank you, Joshua. But here's the reality, Joshua. You are getting older and we need somebody else to do what you did. Joshua won his battles. He fought his good fight of faith. But this elder generation of Joshua and Caleb would soon fade away, leaving the rest of the promised land in its conquest up to another group of people. Which leads us to the opening text that I read to you. Joshua is in his sunsetting years. He has made up his mind as for me and my house. He has made up his mind. I am going to listen to the word of God. Even though my mind doesn't want to do this. And even though I'm afraid. I'm going to submit to what he has spoken to me. And I'm going to put a leash on my brain. And he speaks to another group of people. And he says this to them. You are a numerous people. He is now telling them to be of good courage. He says, go up by yourselves to the forest. There's a lot of land out there. Go to the forest and clear the ground for yourselves, he says. He says this to the tribes of Ephraim and Manasseh, Joseph's two sons that were adopted into the Israelite faith. You see, they were complaining about the land given to them not being big enough. And Joshua tells them, well, fellas, go and clear land for yourselves. If this land isn't enough for you, there's a forest over there. Go clear it out. To which they respond, yeah, we know that land, but all the Canaanites dwell there and they have chariots of iron. But Joshua, they said, they're stronger than us. They're mightier than we are. They have more resources than we have. We don't have chariots, nor do we have the iron that they have. They speak from a place of fear. And can you imagine saying this to Joshua? 
He now has the authority in the spirit by overcoming the spirit of fear because of the word of God to turn to them and say these next words in Joshua 17. You are a numerous people and have great power. He did not entertain the chariots of iron. He did not entertain their fears. He looked at them and he said, don't talk to me about fear. I understand it better than you know. I understand the trepidation better than you think I do. But I also know what God told me. And yes, I was terrified on every battlefield. But I listened to the word of God. I was obedient to what he said to me. And we had victory after victory. And I yes. know that it was not because of me. It was because of what he told yes. me. And I was obedient to what he said. So you have come to the wrong person. I have authority. You see, there's something you have to understand oh. about God. Sometimes the best thing you can ever go through is a trial. In fact, that is biblical. The Bible tells us through manifold temptations worketh in you patience. And patience leads us to hope. These are the things the Bible tells us. And you have to understand that when you go through a trial, you get possession of some things. You've heard a lot of speech about demon possession. But have you heard anybody tell you about possession of demons? When you go through a problem and you come out the other side because God has given you victory, yes. you now can speak to the thing that you've gone through. Yes. And when you come into the room, you'll be hypersensitive oh, to hallelujah. those things that you have fought, and you'll be able to look at it. And with authority, not your authority, but yes. authority that was given to you yes. by the one who spoke to you, you can now speak to that thing, and that spirit recognizes you. Oh, Every individual that fought Joshua knew Joshua. And they knew that he was victorious. And every time Joshua's name would come up in those lands, they would know he's the one who has been wreaking havoc all over this land. You see, the adversary doesn't know us until he has had an opportunity to fight us. And when you overcome him by the blood of the lamb, please don't get me messed up tonight. Please don't get me twisted. You don't overcome by your efforts. It's not by your spirituality. It's not by your 40-day fast. It's not by your extensive prayer meetings. It's by the blood of the Lamb. And when you overcome by the blood of the Lamb, then you can be given a word of testimony. You understand something that I have been tested with suicidal thoughts at the loss of a child. And now five years into the future, still carrying the pain and the weight of that. Now I can feel the spirit of suicide around me and I can speak to that thing and say, we have gone toe to toe and I overcame you by the blood of the lamb. And I can lay hands on someone right now because God has spoken to us. And this is the posture that Joshua is in. And he looks at two young men and he says, my fight is over. I am well advanced in years. We are going to go and retire now and it's up to you to carry this forward. And I need to say to you what was said to me. You are a numerous people and have great power. But my battles are not going to, I'm not fighting for you. All right. You're going to have to go and fight this land for yourself. Right. You don't get to ride Joshua's coattails into the rest of the end time harvest. You don't get to do that. And he speaks to them. He says, the hill country shall be yours. He now moves from a posture of confidence to a posture of prophecy. He says, the hill country shall be yours. Remember what I said, that prophecies need participants. Because right here is a prophetic word through this elder Joshua. He says, for though it is a forest, you shall clear it and possess it to its farthest borders. For you shall drive out the Canaanites, even though they have chariots of iron and though they are strong. He looks at them and he says, I'm telling you what you're capable of. You may not feel like that, and neither did I. I had no idea that I was capable of yes. conquering this much land in seven years. It's not about us. It's because That's God right. spoke it through yeah. us. Amen. However, even though he's prophesying, prophecies need participants. Unfortunately, the tribes of Ephraim and Manasseh never overcame the fear that had penetrated their psyche. Because the forest of Ephraim that they were told to clear out and move into remained a forest. For nearly 500 years. Because later in 2 Samuel 18. Which is 500 years from this moment of Joshua prophesying. You shall possess it. You shall clear it. 
Right here in 2 Samuel 18, there is an internal war going on amongst the Israelites under the leadership of David and Saul. There's this conflict going on. And listen to what happened. So the army went out into the field against Israel, and the battle was fought in the clear lands of Ephraim. No, it's still a forest. 500 years have now transpired. And the people that were spoken to and prophesied to, they said, you shall clear this land out. You shall possess it. Something in their minds convinced them that they could not. They refused to participate with the prophecy. And the men of Israel were defeated there by the servants of David. And the loss there was great on that day. Hear this, 20,000 men. The battle spread over the face of all the country. And hear this. The forest devoured more people that day than the sword. There were people that were roaming about in the forest and they were dying from the terrain of something that should have been cleared out 500 years prior. You see, the uncleared forest of yesterday claimed 20,000 lives today. You think that it doesn't matter? You think that it's okay to just leave a thought just resting in your mind? What isn't addressed today will crop up later. Come on, amen. What isn't cast down today always shows up later. The thing you refuse to address and confess to God, it crops up in a marriage later. The thing you refuse to address and to cast down today is going to show up in your parenting later. The thing that you refuse to cast down, that damage that was done to you as a child, if you don't bring that before the throne and say, God, I don't want to think this anymore, Come and on. you hand it to him. If you Come don't on. do that, that's what you're going to do. The father that damaged you, you're going to live vicariously through your child later. Right. It's going to destroy another life. It matters what you leave in the forest of your mind. Yes. Praise God help us. Today, you and I are no longer fighting on literal battlefields. We're no longer swinging literal swords but the battle is still no less exhausting and it still requires us to be strong and of good courage but since it's not a literal battlefield anymore what is it paul alludes to the new battlefield he says i know we're walking in the flesh i know that we we dwell in the lowest part that body side we but we aren't warring in the flesh the weapons of our warfare they're not they're not swords they're not carnal things it's not things we create anymore Here's what we're fighting. It's still mighty. The battles are still strong. They're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Make no mistake, Paul would say, we still have strongholds, but they're not on heels. Right. We're not going up to forts. We're not fighting against Canaanites and chariots of iron. We're not going and clearing out those literal trees anymore. Let me tell you what the trees look like now. And let me show you where the high place resides now. Let me tell you where the images are perched now. It's up here on this high hill. This is the new high place. This is the place where you put your idols. This is the place where we worship from. This is the place where we're warring. This is the place where there's trees. And I'm sad to say, and I travel a lot, and I'm seeing that people are dying by the droves in the forest of their own minds. We cast down imaginations. We cast down every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. We bring into captivity. Notice Paul's verbiage. He does not say that God is doing it. He does not say that God was going to take your thought and cast it down. He does not say that God is going to bring into captivity every thought. You see, there's this interesting thing that happens in, in the book of Exodus. God says, with a mighty outstretched hand, I will deliver my people. With an outstretched hand, I will smite Egypt. With an outstretched hand, I will part the waters. He says all that from Exodus 4 to Exodus 10. But then in Exodus 17, he does something funny. He looks at Moses and says, Moses, stretch forth your hand. Moses stretches forth his hand, and when he does... Plagues begin to hit Egypt. He then says, okay, Moses, I want you to stretch forth your hand over the waters. And Moses stretches forth that hand over the waters and the waters part. And you and I have already read Exodus 4 through 10. And God said it was his hand that was going to do it. But then God looks at Moses and says, you stretch forth yours. So is it God's hand or Moses' hand that's bringing the plagues in the parting waters? The answer is yes. All right. It's both. It is God that's doing it. It'll always be God. But God chose the medium of humanity to execute his will. And he wants humans to partner with him. And he, for some reason, unbeknown to me, wants to partner with humans in bringing about his will. There is a process and there is an effort to this whole thing. And the reason why 
why we don't like to use the word effort anymore going into 23. Now we're going into this, this year now. We don't like the word effort because we're afraid it's going to damage grace. Yeah. All right. Come on. This is what I've analyzed, Brother Stewart. As I travel, people are afraid that if we say the word effort, strive, when we use these words, it's somehow going to damage God's grace because we're saved by grace, lest any man should boast. And this is what people always tell me. And I say, grace is not opposed to effort. Grace rejects earning. I'll say that one more time. The grace of God is not going to stop you from putting forth your effort. The grace of God doesn't like it when you think your effort earned you anything. Right. All right. Oh, Come on. Oh, I'm spiritual because I fasted 40 days. Do you know what fasting is for, by the way? God loves weak people. Yeah. Fasting was you being okay with being weak for an X amount of days. And God was attracted to the weakness, Come not on. your strength. That's right. right. That's the point of fasting. Well, for some reason, we turn fasting and prayer into our little spiritual currency. It's our two quarters. We drive from the vending machine and we push B3. Miracle, I get one because I fasted and prayed. Uh, Grace is opposed to that. Grace loves effort. We need a generation of Moses to stretch forth their hands. The deltoids of this generation needs to burn as we hold up our hands. We need to learn the life of Christ. We love the death, the burial, the resurrection. That's all we preach. But I haven't heard anybody say we preach the life, the death, the burial, the resurrection. Because John says, if you are his, then you ought to walk in the manner in which he walked. Yes. Well, Jesus, here's what I'm telling you is not going to happen. He's not going to wake you up at 6 tomorrow to pray. That's right. He's not going to do it. He's not going to sit you down like a puppet on a string and make you read the word of God. Right. He's going to advise and then he waits on us to stretch forth our hands. Make no mistake, it is not your hand stretched out that's bringing anything about. It's God's hand, but that's it's partnering right, with your yeah. efforts. Wow. That's good. This is why Paul says, cast down imaginations. Every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. There are times when we must sit, and as our mind is going down a bunny trail, we must stop it and pull it back and say, no, no, no. You are not going there. Yes. When your mind thinks ill of a brother, right. you must stop it and say, no, no, no. We're not going there. When your mind begins to go down a bunny trail, what God's trying to speak to you, and your mind's going off the bunny trail, this happens to all of us. I'm not, hear me right now, I'm not making this a sin. I'm bringing attention to something that God wants us to do. He wants us, let me just word it this way. Do you know why Aaron's sons died? The day they were his first day on the job. In Leviticus, the fire falls from heaven. And finally, we got, we got some priests that are going to go into the holy place. They go in. The Bible says they got drunk and they entertained strange fire. And they were offering incense when God said to offer fire. They weren't at their full capacity. God wasn't demonizing drunkenness right here. He's like, he wasn't making your little list of things to not do and do. He was saying, listen, I want to teach you a thing. If you're going to do this whole priest thing, you need to be on high alert. All right. You can't discern all of these holy, impure, and pure things if you're drunk on the job. And what's astonishing to me is they have, there's the articles out now that they're saying that cell phones are far more intoxicating than alcohol ever could have been. This, there's a new study. Did you know that in your body, there are chemicals created when you get a like on social media that is far more addicting than alcohol? Wow. Here's what I've been doing. I've been, I reached out, I travel all the time. I'm, in the, I'm in, on an airplane or in a car 90% of my life now. And as I was driving one day, I was just, it's been several hours, I was coming home from North Carolina, and as I was driving, I was just sitting there and I got bored. I said, you know what, I'm going to put on YouTube. Uh, video and I'm just going to listen to it so I can have something to do while I'm in the car. And as I reached up to grab my phone, God just stopped me so graciously. He said, did you ask me if I wanted you to watch YouTube? I'm not demonizing YouTube. I, I don't, I'm always hesitant to say this thing because people like their lists. I'm not demonizing YouTube. But God just stopped me. He said, I want you to ask me first. And I said, okay, God, would you like me to watch YouTube right now? He said, not right now. Not right now. I don't want you to do that right now. 
I said, okay. I didn't know why. As I'm driving, all of a sudden, I see clear day. Vision hits me, and I can see a car crossing over the middle line. And I saw a head-on collision. I said, oh, God, is that going to happen to me? He said, no. He said, that happened here. As, I, as he said that, I drove past a cross on the side of the road, and I could see this cross on the side of the road. Something had happened there. And God immediately spoke to me, and he said, that happened here. And he said, nobody's been sensitive as they drive this road. He said, that family's not connected to a church, and nobody's been praying for them. He said, I've been waiting car after car after car, waiting on somebody to hear me scream at them. This is why I didn't want you to watch YouTube right now. High alert. I had to take that thought and take it captive. I'm not saying that I nailed this 100%. And I'll say, as Paul said, I don't speak as though I have attained, but I strive towards the mark of the high power. Oh, I'm striving to pull this mind back and say, God, if you called us to be a nation of priests, if we've called us to do that, I want to be on high alert. I want to discern the things that are around me. But to do that, you have to bring into captivity. We cannot be intoxicated on more and more information at the peril of not being obedient to a spirit of intercession. Because God is looking for somebody to be available and sensitive. You and I are fighting the battlefield of the mind. Yes. And there is much ground still to be had. Much fighting still taking place. There's still many strongholds to tear down. There is a forest of the mind tonight. And each tree represents a false doctrine. A wrong thinking. A flawed motive. A mindset that doesn't line up with the kingdom. <laughs> These trees have to be cleared out. We must be sober. We must be vigilant. We must analyze. We must go through the avenues of our mind. And we must discern every thought against what the word says. I can hear people say things and I say it sounds good but it don't line up with the book. I can hear people preach to me certain things and say it sounds good but that don't, I can't find scripture for what you're saying. I've had people tell me visions and the vision sounded really good and It'll give you the little goosebumps, but I can't find any scripture to back up the vision. And these are the things that we have to be sober towards and we have to be available to. There are trees that must be cleared out. You and I, I must tell you tonight, T.W. Barnes isn't here anymore. All right. J.T. Pugh's not here, and I'm probably saying names some of you may not know. These are powerful men yes. of God in our movement. They're not here. They have passed on, and God needs available participants now. Oh, amen. We're going into 2023, yes. and I believe that the revival God is sending us, we cannot do it the way we've been doing it. We have to come into alignment. I'm not talking about changing biblical things. I'm talking about coming into alignment with what is happening now. We must come into alignment. We must tear down thoughts of not good enough. You're going to have to take captive every thought that says you're not smart enough. Right. You're going to have to tear down the stronghold of wrong family. You're going to have to begin to apply the blood to the thought of past mistake. You're going to have to look at the spirit of yes. anxiety and Put a leash around it. You're going to have to speak to fear. Many of you will have to take and arrest the word shame that has burrowed its way into your mind and say, yes. you know what? There is now therefore no condemnation to those which are in Christ Jesus. Yes. We have to begin to take up arms yes. and go into the battlefield that is the mind. Hear this though. Some of the trees that are planted in the minds of the people of God were planted because of somebody else. You have inherited a forest, many of you. Abusive relationships plant big old trees. Molestation plants enormous trees. Bullying in the past plants a tree. A divorce, a breakup where somebody said, you're not good enough for me, plants trees. And these just lead to more trees. Because when bitterness takes root in your mind, it drops a seed and it plants another tree. And now you got hatred. And hatred, when it fully grows up, it drops a fruit into the soil of your mind. And it burrows its way down and it grows up and it's called jealousy. On, and when jealousy right. grows to its full yes, size, it drops yet another fruit into the ground of your mind. And you now have insecurity. And all these things war against the mind of God. Right. Dr. Carolyn Leaf, who is a neurologist and an author, she wrote a powerful book called Switch on Your Brain. And she shows a map of the brain. She said, we have never had the technology that we have now. And she said, we have seen things now that we never knew. The Bible, she said, was always telling us something that we thought. That we, science was going in a direction. And there was this old saying that has now been debunked. You can't teach an old dog new tricks. It used to be the old saying. Meaning when you get set in your ways, you can't change. Is what we have, we have taken ownership of that. Yeah. 
If that is true, then why does the Bible say to be therefore transformed by the renewing right. of your mind? Right. If you can't teach an old dog new tricks, then there's no hope. Because we all come with false habits, false doctrines that has to be transformed. And if you can't teach an old dog new tricks, then there's no hope for any of us because none of us came with a healthy mind. But she says we have discovered that there's something that we call neuroplasticity. She said the mind is capable of changing no matter your age, no matter the habit. Your mind has more power than we ever realized. And she said they began to put scanners on people's minds. And they began to read. It's almost kind of like an x-ray of the mind. And as they printed it out, she was astonished as she looked at it. She said, this looks just like a tree. Every thought at the initial experience, this is what they had documented. When someone is introduced to some new concept, they, it looks like a little brown dot on these, on these brain scans. She said it looks like a seed. She said, but as you dwell on this thought for 7 to 14 days, that seed begins to grow into what it looks like a little bit of a mushroom on these brain scans. After 21 to 66 days, it looks like a full-grown tree. And after that, it starts growing these branches. These are called experiences. The experience begins to reach over and it grabs onto something else in your life, another memory. And that experience is touching yet another memory in your mind. This is why when somebody has a divorce, it plants as a tree. And the more you dwell on not good enough or something terrible happened in your life, those trees stretch out their branches and it touches the next relationship. It touches the next person you come into a relationship with. And you're thinking, you'll get them out of the side of your eye because that tree of the past is touching this new experience in your life. Now imagine if you plucked it up by its roots and you cast it into the sea where it came from and you plant something biblical there. Imagine if you had a biblical experience and you had a godly experience and it begins to manifest itself. Here's what I know will happen in the child of God. The more I dwell on scripture, the more fruit that I'm able to bring forth, which is a heaven or hell issue because the Bible says they which do not bear fruit shall be cut down and cast out. And if I can allow godly experiences to burrow its way into my mind, and if I can nurture the word of God in my mind, then here's what will happen. I can bring forth love. I can bring forth joy. I can bring forth peace. I can begin to manifest patience. I can begin to manifest, hear this one, self-control. All right. It's not God control. It is self-control. And all of this because of the word of God. It's no wonder that Jesus tells a parable one day. And he said, a sower went out to sow one day. And as he was scattering seed, some fell on good ground. Some fell on shallow ground. Some fell on stony ground. They asked him, they said, what is the seed, Lord? He said, it's my word. I have made up my mind. I have had so many false things that have been burrowing in my mind from a young man until the past few years. And five years ago, I made up my mind. You see, we sat through counseling when our little boy passed away. And as we began to sit through counseling, I thought, there are thoughts inside my head that don't belong here. There's thoughts of suicide that has entered my mind. I've never even thought of that. I've never had anxiety ever in my life. I'm a pretty laid back guy. And I started having thoughts of anxiety. I would be just anxious. I would hear cars alarms and I would get on edge and I began to look at these things and I began to analyze that against the way I used to feel and I said this isn't right I don't like the way this feels and God began to speak to me and he said there's some things that are taking root in your mind that I want you to begin to work with and I said God how do I cut these things down how do I come against these trees in my mind how do I clear this forest he said, is my word not a sword? He said, you can go through that mind of yours with scripture. And what I did is I sat down and I visually imagined it. I sat in the room and I closed my eyes. And I imagined my hand going into my mind and taking anxiety and putting it outside of my body. And then I took a scripture and I put it into my mind and said, be anxious for nothing. I began to take thoughts of different things, anger, and I took it out of my mind. mind, you 
you said, let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. So God, I'm going to partner with you. I'm going to stretch forth my hand as you have already stretched forth yours. God, you are going to help me do this. God, I'm going to go and read your scripture. And so for eight to nine hours a day, I read this book. You see right now, none of this, I'm not here standing here today. You People ask me, why do you love the word of God so much? People ask me questions of, did, was it school that taught you all that? And I tell them the same thing. What books do you read, Brother Holloway? When I lost my little boy, I sat down and I read this for nine hours a day. I am saved by this book. I am spared because of this book. I have a marriage today because of this book. By the way, 90% of people that end in divorce when they lose a child in the church. That's not the world statistic. That's the church statistic, according to the Barna group. And I said, well, this book says that he hates divorce. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to plant that scripture here and not just stack. And so today I have a better marriage than I've ever had. And it's not because of me. It's because of that book. It is time that we begin to participate with the word of God. Not just reading it. Not just hearing it. But doing it. I'm going to grab things out of this mind of mine. When I have thoughts towards my brother, I, I hear the scripture come into my mind. Don't let the root of bitterness get into your mind. And I take out that and I pluck it up and I say, nope, that don't belong there. When I have moments of anger, I pluck that up and I say, I'm not supposed to be angry. I want the peace of God to rule in my heart. I have got a scripture for things that would come against me. No wonder Jesus in the wilderness, the adversary came against the mind of God. Here, here i got a good scripture for you. Here's what I want you to hear. I feel this one in the Holy Ghost. Brother Hereford, Jesus came manifest in the flesh. God Almighty, we know that. There's no debate. There's no argument amongst the his people. But many people don't understand the sonship of God. We're so afraid to talk about the sonship of God when that's for our benefit. We didn't know how to be sons and daughters, so God Almighty had to come down here and show us how to be a son by playing the role of a son. And so as he's standing in that Jordan River about to be baptized, here's what the voice says. Now remember, Jesus said that voice is for your benefit, not mine. So we have to view everything through the lens of all of this I'm doing is to help you. So you need to hear the voice of the Father speaking to a son. I'm still the father. I'm just showing sons how to be sons right now. Right. And so the voice of the father says, this is my son. I whom I'm well pleased. That's good. Hear this. Jesus hasn't performed a miracle. Jesus hasn't even fasted 40 days yet. He hasn't broken bread. He hasn't turned fish into multiplied things. He hasn't, he hasn't healed the leper, raised the dead. He hasn't preached a sermon yet. And the Father's pleased. I don't have a resume. What are you pleased with? Obedience. And listen to the first thing the adversary does. Tries to plant a tree. If thou be the son of God. I'm here to plant a tree. And God Almighty in the flesh with him said. You didn't make that garden. Who told you you were a gardener? You don't get to plant. I'm the gardener. Because I was the one who planted a garden in Eden. Yes. And so the first thing that the adversary tempts him in. Works. If you're a son, you should have a resume. Turn the stone into bread. If you're a son, you should have yourself a kingdom. I can give you one. Every time the adversary comes around. And you see, I have these scriptures. So when people ask me how many camps have you preached? I look at them and say, you don't understand sonship. God is looking at my obedience, not my resume. All right. So the tree trying to take root in my mind of not good enough until I do X, Y, Z can't take root in my mind because I've read the word. And I can look at them and I say, I'm a son whether or not I have many miracles on my resume. I am a son not because of my effort, because who can choose to be born after all? It's because the groom was intimate with the church, his bride, and I was just there because someone invited me. And I came and was born through the church because of the intimacy with the groom. I shouldn't even be here. It's because of the blood. It's because yes, of the intimacy amen. that brought me here. 
I didn't do anything to earn this, but now that I'm born, come on, right. come on, I was born to grow up and be a bride. Yes. And brides don't stop being daughters. They're not living with the parents. They're living with the groom, and the groom asks us of some things. You see, you were born to not just be a bride, you were also born to be a mother. We got too many churches that want to look pretty on a wedding day, just waiting on the rapture, and don't know how to have babies. Come on, come on. Come on. And give of themselves. Because something has burrowed in your mind. I got my golden ticket to heaven. Here we are. Just going to sit here till the rapture. No, you're not supposed to stay a child. You're supposed to grow up and be a bride of Christ. You're not supposed to just stay a bride. You're also supposed to be a mother to the babies that are in the kingdom. That's the ultimate maturing state. From babe, being born again of water and spirit, to full maturity. I give up my body so that the babies can eat. I'm not just here for my appearance sake. I'm here so that there can be provision and that I can be intimate with the groom. That's the maturity level. But we stay in a constant state of childhood because of things of fear. I believe that now God has been speaking to me prophetically. I believe that 2023, God's eyes are going throughout the entire church. Multiple denominations. He's going, his eyes are looking through. But I believe specifically to the United Pentecostal Church. God's eyes, he spoke to me this the other day, Brother Hereford. He said, my eyes are going through the United Pentecostal Church. And he said, I'm looking for those that will be pure. I'm looking for those that will stop participating with the impure things and now begin to lay hold of the pure things. I'm looking for people that will participate and do some work. I'm looking for some people that know that it's my grace that's working through them. But they also are not afraid to put forth some effort. I believe that there is purity coming to the body of Christ, to those that are willing to participate with purity. I believe that people are going to begin to look at things and say, you know what? That's affecting my mind. That's affecting my thoughts. That's making me. I believe some people are going to start getting the backbone and looking at other people and saying, I don't want to hear that talk anymore. I don't want you to say that around me anymore. You have to be fearless in order to have a complete mind. Genesis 3, verse 8. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. The man and his wife, though, hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said, Where are you? God always knows the geographic location of his kids. God was not asking blindly, where are they? Where are they? When God says something like this, from what I can find through study, God is always asking a question, looking for someone to confess. I know where you are. Do you? Where are you? He wants to hear his child say, I'm behind this thought. I'm hiding behind this theology I've created, this doctrine. I'm hiding behind this thing that's burdens me. I'm hiding behind this bitterness. I'm hiding behind this anger. I'm hiding behind this frustration. I'm hiding behind this hurt. I'm hiding behind this fear, this anxiety, this thing that happened, this condemnation. I'm oh, good. I'm glad you know. It's half a battle. I can now participate with you in healing. Why do you think the angel of God looked at Jacob? Do you know what the word Jacob's not a name in Hebrew? It's Yahweh in Hebrew. It means deceiver. And here's what that angel, the Bible says, was God. Listen to what God says. Who are you? He knew who he was. And it's so beautiful when you read it in the original language. He says, Ani Yahweh. I am a deceiver. Who are you? I'm a deceiver. It wasn't him declaring his name. It wasn't him stating his identity. It wasn't an introduction. It was him confessing. I'm a deceiver. I've been hiding behind deception my whole life. I did it with my father-in-law to get a wife. I've done it to get all the way where I am. I did it to get more sheep. Every time I open my mouth, it's deception. Everything I do is deceptive. And when he confessed, you see, it's so strange in the kingdom. Confession should not get what comes next for Jacob. God Almighty looked at him and says, okay, 
You're Israel now, though. Which is power with God. Because of your confession, I can change you. This is the power of an altar where we come to him. And see, I, I, I've gotten this irritant that's gotten into my crawl. And like T.W. Barnes said, it's like, a, it's like a hole in the bottom of my boat. We don't even know how to repent anymore. All right, sir. Brother Hereford, we go to an altar and we just say, Lord, forgive me of my sins. And God's up there saying, say it. Uh -huh. Say it. We're trying to have clean altars. Yeah. Altars were bloody. All right. Oh. Altars were disgusting. There were guts and there was blood of the lamb. And the lamb was, they didn't just slit the throat. They burned the lamb yes. and reduced it to ashes. We're just trying to slit the throat at best. But at worst, we don't even identify. We just come and say, God, I'm a sinner. I need your grace. Lord, forgive me my sins. And God's up there saying, tell me who you are. There's something powerful when that child. You see, I believe that purity, if we're looking for pureness, the Bible says that in Revelation, it says that road was pure gold, transparent. Is pureness transparency then? Are we not trying to go back to the garden and be naked and not ashamed? This is who I am, God. There's something powerful about the child that comes to an altar and just says, God, yeah. I'm an absolute liar. Right. Right. Oh. God, every time I open my mouth, I am killing somebody that I should be loving. Oh, God. God, I have tried and tried and tried, and I am so full of lust. God, I cannot help myself. God, I am more bitter than anybody I've ever met. But what we do is we try to preserve the sacrifice when we come up here. And we cut it at best. That's, that's what we're doing. We're just coming up and showing a little blood from the land and God is like, destroy it. Reveal it. If you want to be pure, it's transparency. And here's the beautiful thing about God is when he hears transparency, he transforms transparency. And he says, thank you for being honest with me. Yes. Now I can come and change you. And that's the power of salvation right there. We think that we're somehow going to make God blush. And God is looking at us and saying, I can take it. I handled the weight of the world on my shoulders when I went to that cross. You're not going to make me blush when you say what's really going on in your mind. And other times we're not just afraid we're going to make God blush. We're afraid of confession because we don't need anybody around us to know what we're going through. All right. So there's something powerful about music in a church service that we can open up our mouths and God's got good ears. He's not deaf. He can hear somebody whisper. I just believe that there is value to not just thinking it, but saying it out loud. Because when you begin to open up your mouth, I believe that all these things are diseases in the body. And the only way to get the disease out is through your mouth. Yes, and when come you come on. up here, what's been in your mind, it's always, I found that when you open up your mouth and you confess that that's up there, something happens in the natural realm because you have activated the physical to participate with the spiritual. Yes. And when those two things come into maturity, it begins to address the psychological. And when that happens, something transforms in the disciple. It happens every single time someone repents. All of heaven rejoices. And when we come up here and we repent, God says, I can change that now. They have confessed to me. They have opened up their mouths. And this is what we're doing, though. We're hiding from the Spirit of God behind trees. But Paul said, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Philippians 4 has become my theme song. And I highly recommend every one of you memorize this. Don't just read it and put it to memory. The Bible says, brethren, whatsoever things are true, yes. whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there's any praise, think on these things. That is a seven layer filter for your mind, for your eyes and your ears. And I have made up my mind if it's not true, if it is not honest, if it's not just, if it's not pure, if it's not lovely, if it doesn't bring a good report, if it has no virtue in it, and if there's no praise in it, it's not coming near the Holloway home. All right. All right. That's good. Before you think we're sanctimonious, we've been, and I'll use this word, I use the word system. We've been in the system a long time. I've been in church my whole life. If you want to get hurt, go to church. 
Amen. I'll balance it back out. If you want to get hurt, go to work. Right. For some people, because church don't pay, we quit that way. It's funny. You can get hurt. I got my feelings hurt at Walmart. Oh my God, I mean, people there can be jerks. Yeah. I don't quit going to Walmart. <laughs> but here's the sad reality. Is you're going to get hurt here. Why? Because this is a hospital where sick people come. And the likelihood of getting sick here and getting hit by something is very high. So just, just know that going into it. They're going to church. You're going to find people that have hurt. And they're going to hurt you at times. And ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness. But keep watch of yourself, lest you also be tempted. Yes. Galatians 6 1. But here's the thing, though. Is if you want to get hurt, come to church. You're going to get hurt here. But when you do, arrest those thoughts and just say, no. And so I've been in the system a long time. I've been hurt in church. I've been hurt by, by people that, in my mind, should have known better. Yes. And here's what I've, I've done I created a pseudo altar. Her name was Amanda Holloway. My precious wife. When I would, when people get on my nerves, but I'd drive home, and I couldn't wait. I'm just gonna go vent. And one day, as I was driving home, somebody at the church did something really just irked me. And so I'm driving home, and as I'm driving, I was just like, I'm just gonna go and load, so I can just get this off my chest. And as I was driving, God spoke to me, said, "Son, what are you doing right now?" I said, "Well, I'm driving." I said, "Oh, you're not." He said, "I'm driving." Right now. He said, "No, what are you, what are you about to do?" And I said, "Well, God, it's been a rough few days." I'm going home, I'm just going to go vent. And he said words that changed my life. He said, is she your altar? He says, she cannot consume what you're about to put on her. For she is not an altar. You are going to put a burden on her now. And now both of you are going to be aggravated. She cannot consume this burden. I'm the only one that can do that. And I said, God, how do I cope with all of this? He said, I want you to commit this to memory. He said, because you've made this a habit. It's not going to just go away now because I gave you that, that neat little word. You're going to have to work at this. So what did I do? I went home and I stretched forth my hand. I sat down and I printed out a picture frame. And I, I put it in a picture frame. And I put on there and I said, if we have to discuss something, and it must be discussed. Because sometimes you just have to discuss hard things in a marriage. If it has to be discussed, we're going to set a timer of five minutes. And if we cannot come to a godly conclusion and a biblical conclusion in five minutes, we're going to put this on pause because it's not time to talk about it. But if it's not pure, if it is not lovely, if it is not true, if it is not honest, the Holloway home is not going to say it. We're not going to discuss these things. And do you know how much peace came into our house after that? Do you know how many things? And this is all after the fact of losing a child. God was teaching me how to live. In this fallen world. I'm coming to a close. And we're going we're gonna to pray over the mind tonight. Since you come to the keyboard. As I was. Meditating on all this. And just studying it out. Brother Hereford. I came across something. I'm a National Geographic guy. I like to read National Geographic. I don't like reading things for sermons. I just enjoy it. I just like learning. And I'm reading in National Geographic, and I was reading about this place in Japan. It's called Aikigahara. It's called the Forest of Souls. Aikigahara is a place, it's, it's a forest. It's so matted that people will go in there, and they get lost, and they can't. And I believe it's spiritual, quite honestly. There are more suicides every year in Aikigahara than anywhere else in Japan. They have to put signs out at the entrance of the forest. Enter at your own discretion. For this before you is the forest of souls. And here's the list of people's lives that were lost by entering this forest. And I realize that as a preacher, I've come to this sobering reality. I can't make anyone do anything as Jesus couldn't make the rich young ruler follow him. As Jesus couldn't make Judas repent. As Jesus couldn't make his hometown hear the word. I can't make anybody do anything. But what I can do is I can stand as a guard post on a forest tonight. And I can say, continue thinking those thoughts of yours at your own parable. For I have seen a forest of souls. And here's the list of people. There are people that have perished. There are people that have just, I attended a funeral today. A man 
man of God, a pastor in our organization at the age of 34, who thought to himself, my life's not worth living, and took his life. I stand at the guard post today, and I ask of you, please, please participate by stretching forth your hand. And when you stretch forth your hand, grab that thought. I'm not going to discern. I promise God I wasn't going to come in here and read everybody's minds. I said, God, I'm going to put forth the word, and I want you to discern in their hearts and their minds. I want you to stand right now. What we're going to do is if you genuinely want to be transformed by the renewing of your mind, I want you to begin to make your way to this altar. We're going to pray for the miraculous over the unseen things. Nobody can see your thoughts. No one can hold them accountable. But God Almighty, the Bible said, the word of God is quick and powerful. It's sharper than a two-edged sword. It's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. That word heart is mind, by the way. God's Mind is on your mind right now. And God is wanting to transform the minds of people. There are thoughts here. There are some of there's some people, there's some seasoned saints. I can feel this in the Holy Ghost. There's some seasoned saints that have heard the prophecy of revival for years. And you don't believe it can happen because you're thinking, well, if that were true, we would have seen it by now. The prophecy I'm here to declare is true. There's been prophecies over this church, hasn't there, Brother Stewart, of, of harvest. And you can probably say, Brother Holloway, that's a simple one. People prophesy that over every church. I'll give you that one. But here's what I can't know. I know some of your thoughts because God just revealed this to me. You're saying, well, you, I've heard that time and time again. The reason why it hasn't come to pass is because of that thought. You have to cast that down and say, God, I believe what was said in this place. And now I'm going to partner with that word and start teaching Bible studies. I'm going to start evangelizing. The, hear me. You're not going to be in a prayer room praying four hours a day. And there's going to be a big flame hovering over the church. And somebody's going to pull over into the parking lot and say, I saw a flame. That happens in rare occasions. It has happened. But that's an excuse to not go and do the human to human interaction of actually dealing with the dirty, just gritty job of reaching people who have different opinions than we do. We have to participate with prophecies and say, God, I'm going to open up my home. There's some bathtubs in your home that needs to be baptismal tanks. There are some swimming pools and backyards that will become baptismal tanks as well. There are some living rooms that will be sanctuaries, and the presence of God will flood through there. There are some of us here that have thoughts of not smart enough. Brother Holloway, I don't know enough scripture. You don't need to know all the scripture right now. What you need to do is just grab a Bible study, and as you're teaching it, you'll learn it. I promise you. As you minister, you become a minister. That's how it works. God is not looking for somebody to go get a degree before you start. He's looking for somebody to start and you'll get the degree as you're going. That's why the Bible, it doesn't say go make disciples in the original Greek. It says as you're going, make disciples. It's an imperative. It says everywhere you find yourself, make a disciple there. Everywhere you go, wherever you're at, make sure you're making a disciple. And so right now, I'm not just going to stay in the vein of souls. There are some of you that don't feel good enough about it because you say I have too many mistakes. How in the world can I minister when I'm this damaged? You see, the devil can take out an insurance policy on many of us because we'll destroy ourselves. And there, I don't believe in the devil made me do it. I believe in human depravity. I believe we're perfectly fine at destroying ourselves. Well, what the devil does is he comes and he discerns that from the outward and then accelerates your depravity. This is why I don't say things out loud. This is why I don't come out of my head all hanging down. Because the adversary can't read my mind. He reads my body. And when I open up my mouth and I say, God, there's just nobody. Nobody wants revival. Nobody wants this. The devil's going to start highlighting and bring around me people that don't want this to convince me of the, of the false lie that nobody wants. And when in fact, there are. There's always scoffers of the day of Pentecost. But there's 3,000 that want it. And if I listen to the scoffers, I'm not going to get to the 3,000. And so I want to teach you something valuable right now. What's in your mind, if it manifests out in your body, the devil just saw it. That's why we got to wash our face when we come out of the prayer room. That don't mean you're fake. That means you go into the prayer room and you lift up. Have you ever read in Samuel? 
You read in Samuel and you read about David and you're like, man, this dude right here is, he's a man of God. Nothing bothers this guy. Man, there's spears being thrown at him and he's not, he's not flinching. He just keeps on going after it. Just seems like he's solid. But then you go read Psalms. And you see the mind of David. My God, my God, why, why have you forsaken me? God, my bones wreck me in the night and you still don't hear. God, every time I cry unto you, you don't listen. You see the mind of David. I, I go a step further. That was the prayer room of David. When you read Psalms, you're reading his prayers. But when he came out of prayer, he left it in the Psalm and he walked out and he said, I already let it all out on the altar where it belonged. And now that I come out, nobody's going to know what I'm going through. It's not you being fake. It's you bringing it to the one who can do something about it. And then you coming out with confidence that he's going to handle it. It's a, a certainty. It's a belief. So here's what I want to do. I want you to stretch forth your hands all across this room. And the thoughts right now must be addressed of not good enough. God, this is it for me. I'm never going to amount to anything. Oh, God, my ministry's over. Oh, God, I did this in the past. Oh, God, this is where I'm at right now. Oh, God, I don't have a degree. Oh, God, I've never even read my Bible. And I've been in church my whole life. God, I pray three minutes a day. I don't even have a good prayer life. I want you to cast all that down and begin to participate with God. And here's what I want you to do. I want you to open up your mouth right now. As she begins to sing and play, I want her to mask your prayers. I want it to be an audible thing. You don't have to scream from the rooftops because somebody next to you probably don't need to hear it, but you need to confess right now. I want you to open up your mouth and begin to confess to God. God, this is what I'm really dealing with. God's not going to get angry with you. God's not going to come slap you on the head. God's going to come down and transform you at your confession. He always meets us at the tree of confession. And he's saying, where are you at? God, I'm bitter. God, where are you at? God, I don't think I'm good enough. Where are you at? He's saying this to us all tonight. Where are you? Church, where are you? Pentecostals of Watson, I am calling you up a little bit higher. He's asking the guest, where are you right now? And you say, God, I don't understand all this stuff. I don't know if I like what I feel. This feels weird to me. God's going to say, okay, I'm going to ease you into this. This is all of me. This is godly. But please, whatever you do, begin to open your mouth all across this room with heartfelt confession. And after your confession, I want you to have a certainty as the Spirit of God floods the minds of everyone present here. After you confess, I want you to allow the wind of God to blow through the trees of your mind. I want you to begin today chopping down every thought with the Word of God. And when you go home, begin to plant the Word of God into your mind. I'm standing here as a signpost saying, don't go any farther into the forest. Come back out. God's going to direct you into a clear place. In fact, ministers in this room, after you feel like God has given you something, I want you to go pray with people. There's going to be a moment in this place where those who have overcome and have a word of testimony, you're going to join with somebody and take dominion over some things. Let's move to this place. Ministers, begin to minister right now. Oh. 